So I'm just curious, we, um, when we start the webinar, will it be just Christina and me on the screen or will all of us be here as well? Yes, uh, it will just be the two of you on screen. Okay. And right. we, have, we have folks joining us now. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Christopher Ryan. I'm an admissions advisor at Stony Brook University. Uh, we have a special faculty workshop here for you today, a topic that's very close to me and you know what my passions are. It's on research rhetoric and writing in college, a student showcase. I'm joined by Professor Christina Lusenko and Dr. Rashmi Rai, and I'm going to pass it on to them shortly, but I just want to congratulate you uh, if you're joining us as an admitted student today. Uh, if not, welcome, and we look forward to fielding your questions thereafter. So take it away. Great, thank you so much, Christopher. Hi, everybody, welcome. Um, we are very happy to speak with you today. And um, we are both, as Christopher said, we're both faculty members in the program in writing and rhetoric. And we're going to talk to you today about um, some of the courses that we teach in the writing program. Um, the three courses that we're gonna be talking about are Writing 102, which is a first year writing course. Then um, we're gonna talk about two popular upper division courses we teach. Um, Dr. Rai will talk about um, Writing 200, which is grammar and style for writers. And I will talk about Writing 303, which is a course on the personal essay. Um, so I think Dr. Rai is gonna start by telling us a little bit about how she um, teaches her Writing 102. And there are many of us in the writing program. There's many sections of Writing 102. So um, they're all a little bit different. So we figured if the two of us could speak with you together, you'd get a sense of, of some of what we do um, you know, the things that we do that are alike and the things that we do that are different. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I structure my writing one or two class into two parts, right? So there's a first part and it's sort of structured around the two essays that the students write. And the first is a, a personal narrative. And the second section is the researched essay, right? So there is a very typical, uh, um, tried that we use, the rhetorical tried that comes to us from classical rhetoric, which I'm sure all of the students also know, logos, ethos, pathos, and then there's kairos. Now the research paper is all about logos, which is sort of the logical argument, and ethos, the, you know, the credibility of your sources and your own, and how that parlays into your own credibility. But I like to start with the personal narrative because I think, you know, what it does, it, it gets students sort of thinking about how to persuade through story and emotion, which is the third part of this triad, right? The and play. that might be surprising for students to, to are they surprised when you, when you assign the personal narrative in your class? They are, I mean, they're not, I mean, I, I suppose because they've already read the syllabus, they know it's coming, but I don't think they quite understand why it's sort of necessary. And partly why it's, you know, the reason I sort of think I really like it is because it's a wonderful way to teach them about structure, right? And, you know, how does it teach about structure? Because, you know, you're writing about your life, you know your life, you know everything about it, but now you have to sort of think about what is the part of it that I'm gonna take out and make into a story. Right, you know, what do you pick? What do you leave? Where do you start it? Where do you end it? So the whole process of finding the story itself is part of the process of, you know, figuring out what structure is. Right. So uh, uh, there is, uh, I, you know, they start by reading a bunch of stories. So a, a bunch of narratives written by professional writers. So it sort of jump starts the process of them thinking about their own writing. But then, you know, then they sort of start, you know, then of course they sort of get started thinking about what the stories are. And, you know, this is not entirely new because, you know, they've already come to it by writing sort of the essay for the personal essay for college, right? They're all, you know, they've sort of written it before. That's how they've gotten into Stony Brook. But that personal essay has this particular kind of shape, right? And it's, a, you know, it's like, you know, 
you might say, oh, here is a setback I've had that I was able to overcome. Here is a passion that drives me. Here is something that I've achieved. But, you know, so they try to sort of show the perseverance or determination or passion because they're trying to sell themselves, right? You're trying to get you know, the school to admit you. But now I tell them they have an opportunity to write this thing again without that burden of sort of selling themselves, but to sort of find a certain truth in what it is that they have to say. And, you know, so the first sort of question is sort of, they have to find the story, right? What is the story that they have to tell? And, you know, I, I tell them to avoid sort of the cliched kind of stories. I used to get so many of these stories that, you know, I went to this, developing country, I went to India, I went to Bangladesh, I went to the DR, I went somewhere in South America. And, you know, I realized, oh, you know, I realized my own privilege, or I realized they had joy too. So I tell them not to tell the stories. And it is so interesting. And I think partly what I'm going to do in, uh, and we're going to do today is give them a sense of the kind of writing we get. And this, you know, and when I tell them not to write, they're like, well, I still want to write about it, but they have to now find a new way of writing about it. So, for instance, I got this great story by uh, the student who writes about not going from Bronx to this tiny little village in the DR and finding he cannot sleep at night because the nights are so very different, the sounds are so very different. But instead of telling the story, he makes a sort of very nuanced and sort of thoughtful discussion about what is privileged, what is poverty, you know, and it becomes a completely different way of sort of talking about it without sort of hitting you on the face with it, right? So there was this other story by this girl who wrote about going to Bangladesh and learning to ride motorcycle, the motorcycle there from her cousins and then coming back to the US and you know going to get her permit and finding she was in a class with all men and you know and it becomes you know it sort of plays with the tropes so instead of you know she's in a Muslim country and they're in a Muslim country you know she learns these things which would not be considered typical for a girl to be doing in a more sort of westernized liberal society so you have you know people sort of finding these sort of clever ways of sort of telling these stories without doing it in any kind of an obvious way, right? Right. So they're maybe kind of challenging these conventional narratives and coming up with a different kind of truth or, a, you know, a, a different kind of insight that is almost like unscripted. You exactly. know, sometimes we do we do talk about ways in which and that's and that's what's so satisfying about narrative is that we often can you know, these stories are, are you know, the, the story of the hero or the story of the, you know, all those things that you mentioned. I mean, that's very satisfying, but but I think it is, it is always um, important to find that story anew, exactly. you know? And so that's what you're, I like how you're describing that. Yeah. So, you know, then there's also the question of, you know, where to start that story, right? You know, and, we have sort of this sort of classic thing that Aristotle tells us in the poetics, a story has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And you think, duh, I know that. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's also this sort of this sense of a structure, right? There's the exposition part, there's sort of the rising action and the climax part, which is the middle of the story, which is different than when the story started, right? Something happens that takes the story from the beginning to this middle part. And then there is the resolution resolution and there is the end, which is a slightly different point than the beginning. You're at a different place than where you sort of started with. And sort of trying to figure out what that structure is, is also sort of complicated, right? If it's not sort of not as trivial as you would think it is. So for instance, there was this, uh, this uh, young student who wrote this lovely uh, essay about going on a hike up a mountain. And you would think there's a story which has sort of an obvious structure. You're at the base of the mountain. It's the beginning, the climb up the mountain is the sort of the exposition. You know, when you come down, it's the end. And it was so interesting to see her work through. It's like, where is the beginning of the story? Is it at the point when I was sitting in my room and I was sort of all bored and I got my friends together and he said we need to go off on a hike was it on the drive there you know which was also not without its event was it you know the breakfast at the diner before we started at the base of the mountain or was it at that point in the middle when we said oh if you go all the way up to the top we might have to come back 
in, you know, it might get dark when we come back. So that's really the point at which, you know, things sort of changed. So, you know, figuring out that thing is not trivial. Right. right and not obvious it's like not obvious yeah. and it seems like it should be obvious but when you start writing it you realize there are all kinds of other subtle things that you want to sort of talk about which sort of puts constraints there was a student for instance who wanted to write about two things he said there was this lovely little story he had about you know fishing with his father but he also wanted to talk about the time when his father was in hospital and you know you know really seriously ill and you know he sort of realized he didn't have to tell the story chronologically. And he was like, what do I put first? Do I start with my father in hospital first, where, you know, you sort of see the sort of terror and anxiety, and then you sort of go off into this other moment where everything is fine and we are out there, you know, the, the kind of you know, joy we have in each other and this moment uh, on, the, uh, on the boat. Or do we start with the boat and we see this relationship that we they have, he has with his father. So when his father falls ill, you feel all the more intensely because you care about this man and you don't want him to be ill and you want him to come out. And so you see them making all these sort of complicated, you know, adjustments to how they write because they realize even something as simple as putting one thing ahead of the other creates something different, right? Definitely. Yeah. And then there's a the language, right? So what, you know, and, it, and I'm so impressed by, you know, freshmen come in and they're all, and they're already, I mean, it's not unusual because these are things that we have already. And what we really like to do in the writing class is to bring the skills that you already have and sort of explore them and just to find them anew. So I had this sort of very moving um, essay written by the student who was again talking about his father's death. But in the second half of the paper, he wrote about him having a breakdown, a nervous breakdown. So there were these two moments and it was interesting, you know, it was so interesting. The first part of this essay, when he talks about his father's death, you know, he, you know, we get it to us in a series of shards almost, you know, it's all broken up. You know, there were these, um, uh, you know, he's the passing chips of ice to his father who's going through chemo. They're sending out messages as all the different members of his family come together. They are, you know, passing out his funeral pictures at the end you know once he passes away so you get it instead of this broken up uh, um, narrative and then when he talks about actually having a breakdown it's written in this beautiful lucid prose where he sort of describes what he's going through and you kind of realize it's because his breakdown made perfect sense to him whereas his father's um death did not so you almost see them sort of creating that sense recognizing there are all kinds of different ways in this narrative to make meaning right so so by the time so you know they come to writing their research paper which is about four weeks into the semester they've already without even realizing it sort of thought through all kinds of complex ways about structure, about meaning, how all of this sort of is created through story and emotion. And now they have to move towards the research paper, which is, you know, is trying to persuade people, but using a very different arsenal of techniques, right? It's all logic. It's all sort of thinking about what is it that makes you uh, uh, credible? You know, who, what are the sources that are credible? You know, how do you pull that and uh, add to your own cred credibility? So, you know, maybe Christina, you can sort of, uh, you can sort of talk about what you do in your class with the research part of it, right? Because- Sure, yeah, because I mean, I, I, I love the, um, I think it's really important, and I and I definitely you know agree that the um, the narrative you know talking to students and and having students practice practice narrative writing and have them having students think about the personal um, you know events the people the value their values the issues that matter to them. Um, and and I and I try what I try to do in, in my writing 102 is I I really ask students to um, to think about identifying a, an issue or a topic that they really care about um, and I have them write something called an eye search paper um, or an eye search essay and it, and and maybe some of you uh, who are in who are, who are watching have have written this kind of an essay before. 
um, many of my students who, who haven't, um, you know, so so I'll just explain it a little. It's kind of like the I, like the letter I, I as in the first person, and search. And so it's a it's a sort of mashup. It's it's a narrative. It's a search narrative. And, and the narrative piece is where the students will um, identify kind of an, an issue or a topic or a question that they have. And they write about the, um, the way in which this personal experience, they wanna test and, in, in, and uh, see and, and explore whether or not that issue is, is sort of shared in the world or how it is reflected in the larger world. And so, you know, as you know, in, in, an, in, an, in a university setting, you know, in a research at a research institution like Stony Brook, you know, research and, and learning about research is so important. And so the iSearch is a way for students to, to kind of learn about that process by identifying, um, you know, this, this topic and kind of writing about the search. And that's the thing about this assignment that I think is, is really useful, but I think is also really kind of, you know, um, something that's unfamiliar to students where they actually write about doing the search. So I'm just going to read a little bit. I actually have an example. I'm just going to read a little bit from a student's um, eye search where I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it and then I'll just read, read some excerpts and I'll kind of explain it to you. So this is a student who is um, interested in STEM as many of our students are. So interested in, in um, in the sciences and she described but but she was you know again as as you will when you come to stony brook or or you know or wherever you end up um you know begin to really think about what you want to do next um or or you know the major you want and 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 sort of your your um the the pathways for you and so this student described meeting up with a friend from high school you know the, after their first semester in college um, went to different schools, they met up together having coffee and, and sort of talking about their experience and kind of casually talking about whether they were, um, you know, going to stick with their majors, whether they were going to change. And, and, and the student described, um, she started reflecting about, you know, her her own educational experience in high school and the, and the science teachers she had. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of what she wrote. So she says, I continued my casual chit chat with my friend, but my mind had begun to spiral elsewhere. The educational memories and experiences I attached to my high school biology and chemistry teachers fall nothing short of exciting and inspirational. Since my freshman year, I had eccentric and enthusiastic science teachers that never let me lose interest in the subject. My senior year AP biology teacher was my mentor who encouraged me to take the extra leap and pursue a degree in biochemistry instead of general bi biology. Had I been placed in classes with other teachers by, by, with other teachers by utter chance, would I even be in the same position today? How many extra years would it have taken me to realize that science is what I love learning about? Is there another field out there that I could possibly like more, but I just don't know it yet? So, so the student is sort of reflecting upon how she became passionate about science and her eye search really, that was the sort of the kernel and the, and the sort of the, the seed of her eye search, which is the role of science education in, in um, kind of a student's um, sticking with STEM, sort of high school education with, with kind of sticking with the STEM major in college. So, so how science classes are taught, curriculum, how students felt about their teachers. So it, and so she questioned whether or not this was her experience only or whether or not it was something she found. So she, she describes, and I'll just kind of go back to um, the essay for a second. And, she she reveals too that she herself wants to be a teacher. So so it's not just that she wants to um, pursue science and maybe go to medical school or dental school, but she she's actually been so influenced by her own teachers, she wants to go into STEM education. So part of what she says here is that um, you know 
in, in recognizing the impact that her teachers had on her and in realizing this is what she wanted to do, she wanted to learn about sort of how she could have an impact on others. So that became this other layer of why she was pursuing this research. Um, so then she writes, um, of course, what is relevant to my life may not be true for the rest of the world. Trying to avoid cognitive bias at all costs, I sought out the real research behind the factors that impact students' subject interests or career choices. This concept wore a veil of simplicity. Was it not completely obvious that positive learning experiences in a subject increase a student's desire to pursue it? And then she goes through going to Google Scholar, going to popular sources, going to different journals. And so she kind of really sets up this inquiry as, a, as an authentic inquiry uh, rooted in something, her own experience and really wanting to kind of test that against what she was finding in the research. And it was so, you know, I mean, you can tell it was her voice, you know, this student has a great, you know, kind of personality, a great, a great style. And I think the thing about this assignment too, is that I think it shows students that they can kind of sound like themselves in an academic essay. They can sound like, you know, they don't have to be, um, you know, kind of dehumanized or, you know, just sort of, you know, take their, their personalities. They don't have to kind of, um, uh, they, they can be who they are and sound like themselves. So that's why I really like um, the iSearch. So, so that was, that, you know, ended up, so, so this student kind of went through and described her searching and described what she found. And then I also assign as the next paper, a more traditional research, research essay, which is something I think, you know, you would, you'll find in the writing program, every every faculty member will assign a pretty a traditional researched argument. And so, you know, thinking about this same student, she um, she wrote about, um, you know, sh she wrote she wrote her her paper about or her final uh, assignment about STEM education and how um, and I'll just read this again from from her essay. So, um, she writes about how you know this passion, this sort of idea, or 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 she's even presenting it as kind of this myth of science as this as this beautiful world of discovery, and and you're discovering all these these wonderful things that are happening, and kind of um, a, a desire for curiosity and to discover more about the world. And then she talks about students being you know kind of worrying about their grades and being so stressed out and kind of how maybe the reality of, of being in a science um, major doesn't quite match up to the the sort of the myth or the romance of it. And, and so she sort of writes that and then she um, kind of describes how um, STEM majors have the lowest, one of the quotes, and I'll just kind of, again, cite from her essay, um, STEM majors have the lowest retention rates compared to all other students, sub, sorry, compared to all other subjects, even at the most prestigious universities. Um, while it's upsetting in itself to witness the lack of passion and curiosity, um, it's worrisome, you know, and then she, then she sort of talks about, you know, STEM education in the United States needs to nurture professionals that the world desperately needs because it increases competitiveness in a field that relies on teamwork, um, discourages continuous learning and neglects the, neglects the promotion of positive self perceptions in students. So she becomes she sort of looks you know, kind of critically at some of the issues that are that are being uh, researched regarding STEM education as a way to really, I think, as you learned from her eye search, become the kind of passionate teacher who really does instill a, um, a sense of curiosity and, and, and wonder in her students. Um, so yeah, so I mean, those are, I guess those are just some examples. I don't know, Rashmi, do you have similar in your, or, or Dr. Rai in your class? <laughs> so, you know, that, I, I mean, I think that's what's important, right? You want to tell them to that, 
the university is a place where you follow your own passions and but you do it in a very rigorous manner and sometimes the way you conceive of it and that way it sort of you know comes up against sort of the institutional requirements creates these kinds of frictions and they have those kinds of frictions even when they go into doing the research themselves right so you know uh, i always ask my students i say think about something that sort of you're really thinking about right now and use that to propel the research question so um, i had a student for instance who said well i'm really thinking right now of whether or not i should be staying in my long distance relationship with my boyfriend from high school so it's like okay go ahead and see what comes up and you know it was amazing there was an incredible amount of sociological research about uh, you know, long distance relationships and their viability. And it was, but it was sort of interesting for her, you know, there was no answer which says yes, stay or no, go. Right. So, you don't get those, <laughs> so you don't okay. get such sort of clear answers, but you get a sense of what are the kinds of pressure points that, you know, would make uh, this much more difficult to sustain and what are the kinds of ways you can sort of mitigate those pressure points. So there was research that, sort of, you know, it gives you answers, but not quite in the sort of straightforward way you want it answered, right? So, and I say, I think that is sort of part of the process of what you know, this sort of teaches them, right? So there are these questions, but then when you go in to start, start researching them, they don't come to you in neat packages. They come in all these sort of, everybody's looking at one small part of the question. And so how do you put it all together? How do you reconfigure it into the context of your own questions and concerns? And that is partly what, you know, the writing one or two teaches you. It teaches you how to negotiate the library, how to negotiate all the databases that we have here, right? how to pull in those citations pull in you know figure out what is credible what is not credible you know pull that credibility into your own writing how to, what is the what are the forms in which you will use um, to sort of write it in, in, and uh, partake of the kinds of uh, formal expectations of college level writing. So I think that is partly what this class teaches as well. Um, yeah, and writing 102 is is the foundational course. These are these are really it's a mindset. I think what you know what, what we also teach is sort of habits and a mindset. And you know, in addition to the library databases and you know, and citation and research, um, and and so it's such an important course. And and we all just, I think, you know, I think we teach it because we also learn so much from our students as well, right? We learn about the world, which is which is amazing. Um, but we also teach other classes besides the first year sequence, like writing writing 101, 102. We teach upper division courses. So this is for students who want to kind of continue on. They have an interest in writing. Maybe they they're interested in one of our writing minors um, that we have. Um, or they, you know, they, they just want to kind of have more of an opportunity to write. So, um, Dr. Rai, do you want to talk about the uh, course that you teach? Oh, the Grammar 200, right? Grammar and style. Yeah. So the one or two, everybody, I think everybody in Stony Brook has to sort of take it, you know, it's uh, at some point. The 200, typically, I think anybody can take it, but it typically attracts writing minors, right? Uh, but it's sort of interesting to me that even you know students who are writing minors who've done a lot of writing themselves come into the grammar class saying i don't know grammar which is such a funny thing to say because we all speak english very well so we clearly know grammar because we speak it uh, and you know we wouldn't be able to speak the language if we didn't know it but there is an anxiety about grammar and i think you know i like my class to be about you know sort of teaching them that this is not something uh, that they need to be anxious about because they know it already so partly what the class is sort of structured around is sort of taking something that they know that is unconscious and then you know learning to sort of think about it and talk about it and analyze it explicitly right so um uh, we start actually by sort of talking about the difference between prescriptive and descriptive because you're so used to sort of thinking about grammar as you can't do this you should do that right <laughs> you know all that finger wagging all the so, rules all rules and you know and i was like no it's about you know we're going to 
first begin by sort of learning to sort of describe it and sort of finding the vocabulary. Some of it is sort of technical vocabulary, you kind of have to learn, but you know, this is not sort of difficult it's stuff. It's 430. Sorry, that's my computer uh, telling me I need to <laughs> move it along. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the first, um, we, you know, we talk about how to describe it. And so uh, there, are, I structure the class again into, into three sections. So the first part, we, you know, we learn this vocabulary, we understand, we sort of describe the various things, parts of grammar. So you they might do things like, you know, parts, parts of speech, uh, you know, what are the formal classes? What are the structure classes? So something like nouns and verbs are formal classes and they're called formal classes because, you know, they, you know, they can sort of take in new things. So we have hundreds of new words, thousands of words that we've sort of, that come in over the, over the decades into English um, in the form classes and the nouns and verbs, but it doesn't happen in the structure classes. So things like articles, pronouns, prepositions, they don't change. And you can sort of see how that works in something like, for instance, the example I give them is uh, they. Right, so this non-gender specific first person uh, pronoun that we need, and you know, we need it for sort of political reasons, you know, you know, for identity reasons. What if you're gender non-conforming? You, you know, uh, uh, how do you refer to yourself? So you need a pronoun for that. But you know, even grammatically, we need something that we sort of think of as a third person non-gender. Uh, third person first um, uh, pronoun. So for instance, if you said everybody forgets his keys, you know, everybody's singular, so you need a singular pronoun. You know, 50 years ago, everybody would say everybody forgets his keys because, you know, nobody, his applied to his and her. But then like 20, 30 years ago, we started correcting it and said you had to write his or her, right? Because his did not include her. So, but now when you say his or her, you know, we now- exclusive. Yeah, even that is not inclusive, right? So we now say everybody include, you know, everybody forgets their keys. This would have been considered ungrammatical, you know, 50 years ago, but now this is sort of the norm because, you know, they has become this sort of singular third person, non-gender specific, gender neutral pronoun, right? And, you know, and there's such a sort of interesting history about it, uh, you know, and we've needed this for, you know, a very long time. It's not like this is something they've, you know, they tried it with Z, there was Thon, but for instance, you know, this became becomes really important in in the law right where you know you're so specific uh, when the grammar in which something is written becomes very very important so for instance in the 19th century you know suffragists started looking at laws which said he and they said oh you know we clearly, women clearly don't need to pay taxes because all the tax laws say he has to pay his taxes. So, you know, and then, you know, both in England and the UK, both in UK and in the US, they had all these laws that they had to pass the interpretation laws which said, no, he means he or she, at which point suffragists said, well, then we can vote, mm -hmm. right? As with Katie Stanton goes up and sort of, you know, uh, uh, tries to vote saying, well, you know, surely he means he or she. And then they had to say, no, 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 they to pass another law, it said he means he, except in the cases where it means he or she, right? So you can sort of see that there is, you know, there was always this need for it. I mean, it became such an issue, this problem with pronouns in the law, that by the time they came to the 19th Amendment, they were like, there's not a single pronoun to be seen in the 19th Amendment, right? Which is probably a good thing now. You don't need transgender people sort of going and saying, okay, we can vote too. You don't need a separate, um, you know, amendment to for that. So, uh, so there's this, so the first part we sort of, uh, of the uh, class, we sort of talk about all these sort of grammatical categories, how they work, you know, why you need them. And then in the second, in the second part, we actually do analysis. So, um, you know, we're so used to sort of thinking about analysis with, you know, imagery. I mean, we do it in every literature class. We understand the analysis of structure, but, you know, we do syntactic analysis. How does the grammar actually shape meaning, right? So that's something that we sort of think about, you know, bring them sort of these wonderful essays written by 
you know, people like Teja Cole and Zadie Smith. And so we look at the, how they structure their sentences and we look at that. And then in the third part of the uh, essay, you know, of the class, I do what I call um, uh, pet peeves, which is essentially, you can't do this, you can't do that. So if they came into the class expecting to sort of get that kind of information, we do indeed sort of cover some of that too, so that there is a sense of, yes, you know, I know what I know, and then you can, you know, you can choose whether you want to go along with the rules at, at all, but that's um, what you, but that's your choice. You do it from a position of knowledge rather than from not knowing, right? It makes it much easier to say, I know that's what people say you should do, but I would rather do it this way because I'm comfortable with this. So these right, are, yeah, you have to know the rules to break the rules. To break the rules, absolutely, right? And so in fact, you know, um, they write three essays, a personal essay, an analytical essay with, you know, a personal essay where they're thinking about how grammar, it has at some point intersected in their life, you know, intersected with something uh, that has happened to them or the second essay they write about an analysis, so they bring in a piece of text that they then, you know, put it through this sort of very rigorous kind of grammatical analysis. And the third one is a research paper where they take up some topic and sort of write about it. So, um, for instance, the first essay, the student wrote this, you know, I had a student who wrote this delightful essay where he talks about how when he was growing up, his parents were really very, very strict with him, you know, kept correcting him. And then he goes and stays with his grandmother in rural Maryland. And and he says, he just learned to enjoy what he calls hillbilly English, right? And he gives, and he gave these sort of, you know, lovely examples. They're too colorful to share here, unfortunately. But he said, <laughs> he gives these great We have to keep them curated. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, gave these great examples. And, you know, and I, I just thought it was, it became this wonderful essay about, you know, the difference between sort of rural and urban in the U.S between working class and professional classes because his parents had sort of cleaned it out from their own language and how they spoke as they sort of climbed up the corporate ladder and they were sort of very aware of it. So it became this, this wonderful essay about how grammar becomes a marker of class mobility and how you can choose or not choose it, right? So, you know, because he was already ensconced in this place, he could choose to go back there. And so it, it was sort of a very... Um, you know, interesting essay. And then he sort of talked about his, um, for his research paper, it was interesting. He sort of, I think he was already thinking about rural America and the kind of substance issues there he had seen in, in his family too. So his essay was about um, slang in um, uh, in drug um, the drug addicts use. And he says, you know, and apparently there's this incredible, you know, amount of, um, words that sort of keep coming in and they keep changing because they're, you know, they're constantly renewing these words because it's a way of you know, it's words, the words you use. So, you know, you can identify who's in your community, who else is. So is it like a code, like a secret code of something like that? And that's what, I mean, it was, that was so interesting about his essay. It becomes both a way to find your community and to keep everyone else out, right? So, you know, that language operates and all, it has all these other ways in which it operates. I thought it was just a very clever essay to write too. And, you know, uh, and you can sort of see, you know, there was this other essay, um, the student wrote uh, this essay about you know, mother, they're Polish, you know, Polish, Polish, and a mother could never use the article the, right? She could never figure out when to use it. So she would, you know, use it when it was not needed and never use it when it was. And then she realized when she started learning Polish herself that it's because it's, you know, Polish does not have the article though. It has demonstrative pronouns. So you can say this bag or that bag, but you cannot say the bag, right? So, uh, so you know, so that was a personal narrative. And then she took that and did a research paper on the use of the article the. And, you know, you and I know this, we would never even try to begin to come up with laws about you know, how to use that. That's one of the most complicated things to learn. And it's so st funny, you know, because I, you know, I've mentioned this in class too, you know, every one of us who's sort of grown up speaking English knows how to use the without even thinking about it. But it's one of the hardest things to sort of come up with laws. I think there are about eight different laws about situational laws and how to use the. And so she, so she talked, uh, her essay was about that. 
and I think I'll bring one last, I'll just sort of uh, talk about one last one. Uh, this uh, student who was, um, uh, uh, you know, she's planning to go into the law and her essay was about, um, uh, you know, uh, her personal essay was about what she called Latin English, right? You know, why are there all these Latin phrases in English uh, in the law when they're perfectly adequate uh, English words? And she said it's because, um, you know, she wondered if it was a kind of gatekeeping, mm. uh, whether uh, it's sort of there to keep uh, everyone who's outside of the law outside of it. And then, of course, she wrote other essays about it. Yeah. You know? And I think in all of your examples, you demonstrate, it sounds like what that's what the students were exploring, how language does serve to maybe connect some people, but also exclude other people. So in the example of the student who's in rural Maryland and is talking maybe about drug culture um, and using language. And then in the second example with the, the you know, if, if, if a, the use of, of an article is, is only kind of a marker of somebody being a native speaker, then, then that also is a way to kind of serve to exclude. And then in this last example, so those are, those are all amazing examples. And I think it also speaks to what you, would, you were talking about in your first, when you were talking about writing 102 and what I was talking about also in um, my discussion of writing 102, which, which, is, which are these intersections of the personal and the, and the academic and really identifying and really reflecting um, a little bit on one's life and one's position and then looking, kind of looking a little bit more deeply into, you know, how that maps onto some of these larger conversations. Um, and so I'll, I'll, talk just very briefly about a, a, the, the class, the upper division class that I teach, which is writing 303. Um, it's on the personal essay. It's a very popular class. Um, I love teaching it. I think everybody who teaches that class just, just enjoys it so much. It's a class that's really um, popular with, I would say, maybe juniors at Stony Brook, sophomores. Um, it fulfills a, a certain writing requirement that, um, that some students have um, related to the, I think, the health science, in the, in the health sciences, or I'm not exactly sure. Um, but it, but and it's also um, highly recommended by academic advisors for students who are uh, looking to apply to graduate school, to medical school, to dental school, because we work on the personal statement. So just as you all wrote your personal essay, your college admissions essay, um, in applying to graduate school or med school or dental school, it's another, that's another, it's another kind of essay that is um, in which students describe, they sort of write about, you know, sometimes there's a prompt, um, but they, they write about some meaningful experience or some, something that has shaped them to, um, in, in their, in their, you know, on their pathway to, to want to go to medical school or dental school. And so, you know, it's, I think it's an essay that students are really, really anxious about. And they, there's a lot of anxiety and kind of writing. So the class is really great because it's supportive. And I think we're in an, in an environment, but, but in fact, we we're writing lots of other things, not just the personal statement. And I think that's actually really helpful um, because I think students are practicing writing all the time. I mean, we, we write, I have students write every week, they write something called a quick write in response to these prompts that I give them and I tell them they're, they're kind of just show up prompts. So you set your timer for 20 minutes and write and don't edit, you know, yourself and, and, you know, some of the prompts are so like, you know, write about a time you said goodbye, uh, write about a time you taught yourself a skill outside of school, write about a time you were really bored. Um, and I think it, you know, and then students write and they respond to each other. And these are very low stakes, quick um, ways for them to write. And I think, you know, as Dr. Rye and I, we've talked to each other about, and we talk about this in the writing program, which is that writing is thinking. So, so you, you can think, you know, and certainly as if you're like me, you know, you have some you have great thoughts when you're walking the dog or you're taking a shower or, but you can also have really powerful insights when you're writing. You don't have to wait for the insight 
and then sort of transcribe it. You know, so often it's just giving yourself the permission to sit down, not know where you're going and just write then the insight comes. And I think that lesson that students learn through this frequent writing is something that really helps when they're working on the personal statement, because I think they, they allow themselves to just sort of be surprised. And I have a lot of students who surprise themselves with what they end up writing, you know, once they kind of give themselves permission to, to just write. Um, and they also use a lot of peer reviewing, right? That's also yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was the other thing I wanted to kind of talk about in, in the workshop. Um, so, you know, with writing 303, just like we do in 102, but in writing 303, I mean, students are writing, this is the personal essay, they're writing about very deeply personal experiences where they're very feeling maybe very vulnerable. And so I tell them what happens in 303 stays in 303. You know, we have a kind of, you know, we, we, we share these with each other, but we also, um, we, are, we are very respectful and kind of, you know, I think honored by what we share with each other. And so I have students who are also surprised because, you know, initially they're sort of terrified that they have to share these personal experiences with each other. I mean, you know, and that makes sense that they, that they would, but I think once, over time, we build a kind of trust in the classroom. And I think that students really feel connected to each other. And certainly this was the case over the pandemic when we were in, when we were online, we would have these small Zoom sessions, you know, five students workshopping, talking about each other's writing. And it just became really, um, you know, really moving and very powerful. And that students really were very conscious in these small sessions it's not just like you're writing on somebody's essay and you don't have to look them in the face. You know, when you're in a small, when you're in a room and you're talking to somebody, they really became very conscious and aware of how they spoke to each other and how they gave each other feedback. And many, you know, were surprised at how meaningful and how much they learned from that kind of interpersonal um, kind of connection and that communication, which is, you know, maybe something that you don't always think about when you think about a writing, a writing class. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, th I think that might be what we want to talk about. I think we want to leave time for questions. Do you, do you what do you think, Dr. Rai? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we 15 minutes, hopefully we have a little under 15. Um, uh, Christopher, go. Uh, are there questions? Uh yeah, yeah I, I'm back. And, and thanks for, you know, leading this faculty workshop today. There are a lot of great takeaways. Uh, for me personally, some of the best writing advice that I had ever gotten was to be honest about my conflicts. So uh, a lot of what you were sharing really kind of hits home for me uh, and building on that. Um, all right, so I'm just going to kind of go in order. Uh, some of these are going to be quicker than others, so feel free to uh, pontificate if you would like, but otherwise uh, we have about 12 minutes left. Uh, first question, how would you suggest going about research in an unbiased manner and implementing and enveloping research well into one's writing? So you did talk about that briefly already. So maybe I, I will sort of take it. I mean, you know, this is sort of part figuring out what is biased in research is uh, an ongoing task, right? Because, you know, when you sort of go in, you know, go in and sort of look at what is already out there, you know, research is always a function of the knowledge base that already exists. And those knowledge bases are structured by power. Right, and the university is a place where knowledge structures power, and and I think part of what the, you know we like to think that in writing one or two we do is sort of open up that process to questioning, so that you realize that you are part of that process. That partly your interrogation is going to change the face of research in the future as well. So it's not just a question of is the research that already exists biased or unbiased, but it is also your intersection with that research, how you think about it, what you do with it, and how you take it from this point onwards, right? So what are the kinds of questions? You know, the reason I sort of like to start it with sort of from, from a personal point of view is that 
I tell students that when you go to research, recognize if you're talking about something that is important to you, recognize that you bring knowledge into it, recognize you bring your own experience into it. And it sort of tells you whether what you're learning or hearing is adequate or complete. You know, it sort of shows you what gaps exist. You know, knowledge, you know, is constantly, this is what we're doing at the university. We're constantly creating knowledge, but these, this knowledge has to uh, be shaped by the people who are sort of going to move it forward into the 21st century. And I think, you know, that's a great question to ask. Um, and I think, uh, and I love that they're already thinking about it. And we want our students to be thinking about it going forward, that they are part of this change that's going to happen, right? Absolutely. Uh, L Professor Lysenko, would you like to add anything or? I mean, that was so beautiful. I really don't know if I can, I, cause I think it's true. And I think, I think your point of, um, you know, this, this idea of, of what constitutes knowledge and really we, I think we have to always question that, you know, I think we have to question, um, what, and, and it's not necessarily just you know, and certainly the difference between like a popular source, a newspaper or a academic source, but it's, it's more, it's, it's even more like it's bigger than that too, just in terms of like, what are the systems or the frameworks that, that shape what we know? And those are really profound, big questions. So, you know, come, come learn with us. Let's, let's all, let's all work together to, to, to work on these big questions. I love that. I think that really wraps up everything nicely because from a foundational standpoint, um, you have to understand the, the dynamics of the system to begin with before you can, you know, possibly even start addressing the, the biases that are present. Um, next question we have, are the classes you mentioned uh, throughout this workshop, are they specific to majors or are they available to all undergraduate students possibly fulfilling an SBC, a Stony Brook curriculum requirement? Yeah, actually, they they are. They're they're open. Um, well, writing one hundred and two certainly is is open to all students. I mean, all students will take writing one hundred and two, um, and that does satisfy one of the SBC requirements. Um, the other courses that we mentioned are open to students, but I believe that. Um, mine writing minors often are given a kind of um, sort of pref preference as far as registration because our classes are, are so small. I mean, we have, you know, our classes are, I'm no more than 25. Um, and in some of the classes, they might even be a little bit smaller than that. So, and we keep the, you know, the, the enrollment caps are kept low so that we can have the kind of rich discussion and and one-on-one -on -one interaction that we've just been describing to you. So, um, so you know, declaring a minor in one of you know, one of our two minors certainly gives you a better chance of of getting into one of these classes um, because minors are are um, you know are able to register. But that's not to say that um, the classes are are unavailable to any student. And these are courses that are offered every semester in multiple sections in the winter, in the summer. Usually, at least the personal essay is. I know. Um, so uh, so they're they're offered pretty frequently. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, kind of in a similar realm, uh, I love this question as well. Uh, what is a typical, typical English major's plans post-college? And so uh, maybe I can just give a little lead in because I was an English literature and rhetoric major in undergrad. And um, so I, I initially transitioned from biochemistry uh, thinking I was wanted to go to medical school. And so I brought this kind of analytical mind to uh, the English literature and rhetoric framework. Uh, I can just say as a baseline that there is no uh, typical plan after undergrad. Uh, the skills and the things that you're going to study in undergrad are so transferable that they often uh, relate to another passion that you have in your life. Uh, and so it really gives you the opportunity to pivot into different you know, industries, career choices, whatever it might be. And I'll uh, leave it there and, and set both of you up with that. You know, and I think the difficulty, though, you know, with sort of humanities majors is that there isn't a clear path, right? If you take, you know, you know, medicine, dentistry, architecture, law, it feels like there's a very clear path. And this is one of the, I think what, what research has shown is that 10 years down the line, 
you know, humanities majors do as well as sort of STEM and professional majors. The difficulty is getting through those 10 years because you have to chart <laughs> your own plan, right? And sort of find your own way because the higher you go up in your profession, the more the skills that you use, the, the, uh, the interpersonal skills, the communication skills, all of those skills that are, you know, the analytical skills that you learn in, in a much more diffuse uh, way uh, in the humanities become very critical because those are the skills you will need, right? You know, if you are, even if you're doing, you're going to be a computer science major, you know, the first few years you'll be writing code, but the higher up you go, it's all about managing your team. And then by the time you are a CEO, all you're doing is probably sort of thinking about how to interact with the press, right? And, you know, <laughs> showing up uh, in, in front of Congress, what will you say? It's all about communication at that point, right? So the skills we teach you are the skills that are critical for you, the higher up you go, you know? So uh, I will not say it's going to be easy the first 10 years. I imagine are going to be hard because you have to really figure out what it is that is important to you, what you care about, what you want to do, what your passions are, and trying to figure out the role that your passions are going to play in the professional world is kind of tricky, I imagine. It's not that easy to sort of negotiate. But once you figure that out, um, the skills we teach you will be invaluable. Absolutely. And um... On to the next question. I uh, just lost my train of thought. Uh, are, <laughs> it happens to the best of us. So um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, speaking about diversity uh, regarding literature and writing classes, uh, what, what's the latitude here at Stony Brook University? I'm not entirely certain I understand. Are so, there diverse options? I, um, yeah, are there different, um, you know, concentrations within writing and literature, such as like Hispanic literature, you know, world literature, different areas? What what can really be covered in uh, the curriculum at Stony Brook? Okay, well, I I mean, we uh, I can speak to some of the classes in the writing program, but um, you know, we there is there's the English there is an English department which is separate from the writing program, and so you know that would that might be something to kind of look into. Um, and see what their course offerings are in, in that department. There's a Hispanic languages and literatures department also, which is another department where you would probably want to kind of just maybe cruise around the website there and see, see what the faculty are teaching and what, what the offerings are um, there. And, and in the writing program, I mean, we have we have faculty, I mean, I would say, you know, I, I, I know a lot of our faculty are really teaching global literature, you know, I mean, we, we are a diverse bunch um, and we, we do teach, our students are diverse. I mean, I know myself when I, when I think about the courses that I assign in the, in the writing 303 course, I often, I, I sort of look at my roster, you know, I, I look at the students who are in the class, you know, I want to see who they are because I want, I want the essays to speak to them. And it, and it doesn't mean that I can know who a student is just by looking at them or see, but, but I also want to make sure that there's, a, that there's a range of voices and that there's a range of perspectives and experiences that are represented in the classes so that students feel you know, they can, they can kind of connect and they may connect with, with voices in really unexpected ways, um, but it is really important to to make sure that um, you know that I, that I think we look at who we're who we're teaching. I, I think it's really important to to look at who we're assigning in our classes um, and who we're who we're keep, who whose voices we're reinforcing. I, I know that's something that's important to me. You know, we're a public university, a public university in New York State, the most diverse state there is. So, you know, it is hard to sort of come into a class and not see a sort of range of people in the class. And we, you know, and your professors know that, you know, and we sort of speak to that, you know. Yeah, excellent point, Dr. Rai. Um, moving on, we have a couple minutes. Uh, what do you find students struggle with most in their first year uh, with the undergraduate writing classes? Um, 
you want to start? Yeah, you know, and it tends to be very different things. You know, it's so funny because uh, uh, right, uh, we get sort of a range of skill sets, and, and and I think that is partly the thing. You know, we have students who have done AP research in high school and done sort of advanced level AP classes. We get students who thought what, I have to do more writing? I'm a STEM major, I don't want to do that, <laughs> right? So you get a range of these things and you find actually, you know, they, you know, they all struggle fundamentally with this one idea, coming up with the argument, right? They, I think, you know, that is the one thing that all of them, what is this thesis that we're writing that is an argument? And it's a very difficult sort of concept for them to sort of grasp onto, um, you know, and that's the thing it's that I want to tell them that, you know, are we out of time? Uh, you know, I, I tell them that, you know, what we have to sort of understand is that language right now is really an, a knowledge is really an argument, right? So whoever has the best argument, you know, they are the state of the knowledge right now, but in 10 years down the line, that there's going to be more information, more knowledge, and then that what is considered the knowledge right now might sort of change. So we need to sort of think about writing in a sort of in this sort of argumentative manner, sort of figuring out what this argument is. So I think that's sort of the idea that sort of the struggle with the most. Um, so uh, I would not say, and that's sort of across the board and, and um, uh, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, Professor Lusenko, do you want to add to that? I mean, I think I'll just I'll just maybe um, say a little bit about. Um, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I think just habits. I think sometimes habits, uh, developing healthy habits, and sort of balancing. Um, you know, I, and, and I mean, we've, we've just been living through and you all too, a really rough year, I think balancing the work with also, you know, time away from the screen, um, time away from the work to sort of re restore and recharge. Um, so, you know, I, I think that just sort of adjusting to maybe students own expectations and, you know, and kind of beginning to calibrate and also continue, you know, just making sure they they sort of you know keep themselves healthy, um, whether that's finding a social group or resting when they need to, um, you know. So so I would say I really encourage in my students um, to you know to take a little time away, let the ideas percolate, um, and and just give themselves a rest when they need it too. So I think that's really important. Yeah, and you know, uh, I think uh, the, the intersection of, you know, your answers and what you had shared and talking about the STEM, uh, you know, student, for example, uh, I, I was that student at first. And so uh, for me, I think the hardest thing was to trust the process. Um, that, yeah. that, that, was, that was a big part. And the, the area specifically that I kind of had the most tension in was the revision process. Uh, <laughs> When, you know, being a young writer, you think, okay, I wrote this assignment or I, I wrote this piece and, you know, I'm done with it. But, uh, you know, reading my work aloud, discovering my voice, and then, you know, really challenging myself to improve the writing that I had uh, was a really big learning point for me. I'm going to bring you back into my class, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> Come, come to the writing program. <laughs> very hard to teach students. I probably should say that. You know, should take the revision process seriously. They're like, it's done, you know. I will put it in my PR, I will change the spelling there, but you know. Trust, trust the process. And you have to be sort of comfortable with kind of chaos a little bit. You know, you have to be comfortable with the mess because it's not quite tamed yet. It's not quite organized and that's that's really hard and so trust the process i think that's very wise yeah, absolutely and I, you know i work with uh you know high school students who are college bound and i tell them that with their essays just trying to impart little pieces here and there and uh you know i, I hope it helps at the end of the day sure so uh you know we we did run a little bit long today uh professor lusenko do you have something else to add well or? i had Slide, I had just those three slides I wanted to show really quickly at the end. With, okay, yeah. good. So I'm going to just good. very quickly. Oh, wait a minute. Where is it? Um, let's see. Here it is. Hold on. If I could just. 
Okay, yeah, I just wanted to sh share with you um, some slides just to kind of remind you of, of what we talked about today. Um, these are all the courses that we teach in the writing program. I mean, we only talked about a few today, but as you can see, we have grant writing, we have research writing, technical communication, writing for the health professions, the personal essay, global literature. So we have a range of courses and they're all writing intensive courses that we teach. Um, and just reminding you again, we both talked about writing 102, Dr. Rye talked about writing 200, grammar and style for writers, and I spoke about the writing, uh, the personal essay, writing 303. And then we just wanted to kind of give a little pitch for our two minors that we offer, the professional writing minor, the writing and rhetoric minor. So, you know, if you, we don't have majors right now, but if you are a bio minor, I'm a bio major, but you like to write, the writing and rhetoric minor could be a perfect complement or it, it's really a compliment to any minor. So um, so these are the, just the two minors just to, for you to keep in mind. And writing 102 counts towards either minor. So you've already kind of taken, you've gotten three credits um, out of that. And then I just wanted to leave our email addresses. So if you, if either, of, if anybody out there wants to reach out to us, please do. Um, yeah, that's it. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, this will be available in a recording on our YouTube channel afterwards. So you can always, you know, screenshot this now or, or check it out later. And to, to Professor Lysenko's point, I want to say, I want to push you to get the writing minor, even if you're not interested in writing, because the skill of writing and communication will pay you dividends that you can't even imagine right now. Being, a, being able to convey your ideas and share those with people and possibly change people's minds is gonna be critical to your personal and professional pursuits. So uh, thank you all for joining us today and uh, we hope to see you soon. Uh, keep in touch with us if you have any questions. We have the enroll at Stony Brook email address and the email addresses of our presenters on the screen today. So thank you. Take care everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good luck.